So to begin with, uh, my topic is statistical machine learning. And I have mentioned classification and clustering as sub areas. But actually, I'm a little wrong here. I, wrong in the sense that it's, uh, I'm not uh, actually incomplete. In the sense that regression also is counted as, uh, is counted as a statistical machine learning uh, area. Okay, so because I had seen the program and I had I knew that Professor Rao would be covering, uh, sorry, Professor Pandey would be covering it. So I have actually excluded it because there's not enough time. And my objective, uh, you see, you must uh, you must bear in mind that I do not have any background in the medical sciences. I'm a statistician by training and experience and everything. So what I would like to do is give you an overview of some of the most widely used machine learning tools so that you get uh, get some idea in just in case you don't have any idea and then maybe you will be able to judge how to use it in in your future whether you turn out to be physicians or you turn out to be uh, academicians how to how to apply them to different kinds of you know, uh, data data, uh, data analysis tasks that are related to the medical sciences, okay? So I do not know anything about the medical sciences, but at the end, I have, I'll be, I have a few slides where I'll be talking about some possible applications. Now, these slides are all borrowed slides because I, I do not have any background, so I just went, took the help of the internet, and I found that people have worked in these areas. I'm sure lots of people are working in these areas. So I found a few and I've used them. So just take them as you know to as some indicators of what what possibilities there are. Uh, health sciences are rich in data. You have to make sense out of that data so that you can use that to make uh, you know the, uh, to perform certain tasks in a more efficient way. In in the hospitals, in in research in health uh, research institutes. The physician is the king, the researcher is the king. But if somebody helps him to make sense out of the data, if some tools can help him or her to make sense of the data, why not? By all means, you should make use of that. Okay. So with these basic, ide basic ideas, I'll move on to, the, to my next slide. So this is a quick outline of my talk. I'll talk about some broad issues related to machine learning. First of all, I'll tell you what is machine learning. Then I'll talk about some broad issues related to it. I'll talk about machine learning tasks, and I'll talk about some, give you an overview of some well-known, uh, they are all well-known methods, statistical machine learning uh, methodologies, both supervised and unsupervised. Now, as I told you, I'm very fortunate in the sense that the earlier speakers have already you know, introduce some of the ideas that I, I'm also, I'll, I will also be referring to. So uh, I, I hope that'll, you know, that'll help you to understand these ideas even better, just in case you were not aware of them before today, okay? And finally, some applications in the health sciences. So what is machine learning? Now, it's a big, it's a buzzword today. Machine learning everywhere. So basically, uh, like Professor Rao pointed out, statist statisticians have been doing it for years, for decades. But you know, the problems have always been there. The problems that statisticians were trying to, you know, provide solutions to, they have been faced by others too. Computer st scientists they approach the problem from another direction, but they all converge to the same place. Okay, so that is why terminologies are different, but goals are the same. You know, maybe tools, uh, you know, machine learning community uses statistical methods freely, okay? It, the statistics has a massive contribution to make in the area. But th th that is not at all. There are methods uh, which are not statistical, but, uh, but they are quite widely used in the machine learning by the machine learning community. So another very, uh, very hot area is artificial intelligence, okay? So there was a time. Uh, in the 80s, when I was a you know I was a PhD scholar, when the this phrase artificial intelligence used to be very hot, you know people used to talk about artificial how you can make computers perform the kind of intelligent tasks that human beings can do. That first of most most common uh, commonest the commonest of which is taking making decisions taking decisions based on information. Okay, so in those days, uh, they used something, they, the, the approach used was to construct something called expert systems. So basically, set of rules, 
uh, in, uh, which exploited data to arrive at certain decisions. But that approach died down, and it's only very recently, in the last few years, that again the word, you know, the phrase has come back, and it's become very fashionable, and it's actually nothing but. Uh, so machine learning is actually uh, so be, uh, is actually become uh, is is become a part of the the broad objective of artificial intelligence because making machines learn so when you look at the phrase machine learning it essentially conveys the idea that you're trying to make machines learn to perform certain tasks right so machine meaning basically a computer right so the the goals of artificial intelligence and machine learning are almost similar, but I would say that artificial intelligence is a more general uh, general term. So in that sense, machine learning is some sort of a sub-area of artificial intelligence. But this is not important. Now, what is important is that to be, uh, to be an intelligent system, uh, it should be able to acquire knowledge and to learn from that. Okay, so that is what characterizes, uh, you know, machine learning methods. Okay, so there's another, some famous people have already characterized what is meant by machine learning, and I think they are pretty concise. That's a, this is a, they have given very concise definitions of machine learning, so no harm in going through them. So learning is any process by which a system improves performance from experience, okay? And another, there's an equivalent uh, uh, rep representation of the same idea by Tom Mitchell, who says that machine learning is the study of algorithms that improve their performance at some task with experience. Okay, so performance is denoted by P, task is denoted by T, and experience is denoted by E. Now the reason this P, T, and E is important is because when I go to the next slide, uh, some examples are there which, which, you know, which make use of this T, P, and E. So suppose your task is to play checkers or any other board game. Okay, and how, how, will you, how will you assess your performance? By looking at the percentage of games that you win against some opponents. And what is the experience, uh, and what, what is the E component here then? You, when you play practice games against yourself, you try to learn where you're going wrong, where you're making mistakes, and you improve your performance, okay? So, and then, so this is from a day, from, this is an example uh, of a learning task from day-to-day -day, uh, life. Now, when you go on to uh, slightly uh, more advanced uh, uh, view of this, uh, uh, of a machine learning task, then a better example is where you want to recognize handwritten words, that is your task. So somebody gives you a document in which something is written uh, by hand. So you want to use some algorithm to, so that you know you can grab, in, uh, collect data from that, and you can, you can, you can, uh, you know, uh, you can, uh, you can extract the words from that document using some software, and then you would like to recognize what words are there. So suppose I, on a piece of paper I li write my name, Amita Pal. Then that algorithm, when, I, when, it, when, 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 when it runs on the uh, runs on that scanned version of that paper, it should be able to recover those two words from the document. Now it may not be able to do so all the time. So that is why that is where the performance is, comes into play. And how will you me measure performance for this kind of a task? Through the percentage of words that are correctly classified. And how would you, how would you, where is, how does the E component come in, the experience part, is where you make your algorithm run again and again on a large collection of, of images of handwritten, uh, handwritten text, which where, you know, you, you have the, you have the domain knowledge, whereby the words in your, in your document have been, uh, have been, you know, have been expressed by someone who has, uh, by a human being who has, who has expressed them in the form of words, okay? So basically using label data and by running the, so that is the sir already talked about label data. You have, you make use of label data and you run your algorithm again and again on it and that is how you expect to improve performance, okay? So these are basic ideas of machine learning. And when do you use machine learning, to, uh, when, when is it, it useful? It's useful in, and not, it's not always useful or meaningful. It's useful when human expertise does not exist. Okay, so this is, so this is a borrowed slide. I've given the credit at the bottom, but I think it, it illustrates many basic ideas. So where people, where human beings, when there is no prior knowledge available for some problems, then machine learning can help. 
you don't have knowledge, but you have data on some related variables. From that, you can try to get more information using techniques like unsupervised learning. Like Sir, uh, sir mentioned, you have data, you, you want to explore that data set to arrive at more concise information that can be useful for certain tasks. Okay? So also, it's useful when humans cannot explain their expertise. Okay, so when, uh, when somebody says something to me, say, for example, he says good morning or good evening to me, I'm able to, uh, I, you know, uh, to recognize the words because, you know, at, from, from my childhood I have been hearing them and somebody told them what they mean and so on. So, but how do I do that? How do I recognize that the words that he has uttered is good evening or good morning? And the, it's because I have learned that. But I do not, uh, nobody, uh, I mean, uh, how the human brain does that, that in information processing, processing of the speech signal is something that has not been deciphered so far. But it's possible to mimic that, that, uh, that uh, recognition capability, speech recognition capability of humans using other types of algorithms, not the, the mechanism the human brain uses, okay? And of course, uh, in special cases when you, you have to customize models, for example, when you have to personalize medicine for sp specific patients, or if you have a huge amounts of data, okay? So that the, in these situations, machine learning uh, techniques can be very useful. And if, but of course, they will not be useful if the, if the data analysis that you're going to perform is, is, it does not involve any variability, okay? So whatever you're doing is, is streamlined and customized and, for example, like calculating payroll, okay? Then there is no variability in the data in the sense that the, the, uh, the algorithm that you are uh, implementing on it is, you know, it's streamlined and customized. So here machine, it's, it, it's redundant. Using uh, machine learning techniques is useless, waste, wastage of resources. Okay, some more examples are here, I'll just skip through them. So, um, uh, okay, okay, now maybe I'll not go, skip through completely. So the, look at the, uh, the dark, the black text on the slides. Uh, recognizing patterns, so machine learning can help you to recognize patterns. So one example of that I already talked about, recognition of words, you know, speech recognition as I called it, recognition of, you know, written characters. Of course, as you know, there's a lot of variability in handwriting, so you cannot, exp I mean, as of date, I don't think there are uh, very good algorithms for recognizing handwritten characters very, very efficiently, but printed characters, as you can imagine, because the variability is not so high, there are algorithms which can, which can actually do so. They can recognize pr uh, printed, uh, printed uh, uh, text uh, quite ex efficiently. Okay, so you must have heard of optical character recognition. Okay, have you come across that word? So basically, you have a scanned do document where, you know, there's something written, maybe typed in it in, in English. When you run it, pass it through the uh, an OCR software, it will return the text that is contained in the, in that document, okay? So that is what is OCR. So these are actually, these are very commercially, um, uh, you know, uh, lots of commercially uh, uh, successful softwares are avail available for su such tasks, okay? And recognizing anomalies. Machine learning methods are useful for recognizing departures from normal behavior, okay? So that is uh, by, by the, in, the, in the finance sector, in the banking sector, they make use of that, okay? So fraud, so if some transaction, for example, in a credit card, card is fraudulent, you can actually, uh, you know, construct machine learning algorithms which can detect these fraudulent transactions because they represent departures from your normal spending pattern. Okay. And of course, uh, the, the last uh, and most important uh, application of, uh, or a very important application of uh, machine learning tools is prediction. How to, pre uh, given, given uh, you know, data from the past, how to predict the value of one of the variables or several of the variables in the future, okay, using appropriate models. Okay, some more, uh, okay, uh, one I think I'll, I'll like to mention is one very important commercial application and useful application 
is, is in biometrics for access control. Okay, so you, for example, you, a very, uh, very, uh, day, uh, a very familiar example is the fingerprint uh, recognition that your mobile phones have, or facial recognition that your mobile phones have. They all use simple machine learning uh, 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 algorithms for this purpose. Okay, so there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, there are lots and lots of areas where you can easily apply these to, you know, to make our day-to-day -day lives easier, simpler, and in the case of the health sciences, to assist the healthcare professionals in their task, okay? They are the experts. The healthcare professionals are the expert, but by the application of these uh, machine learning techniques, the task can be, uh, you know, uh, more sense can be made out of the huge amount of data that is available, and that can make the life of the healthcare professional Simpler, okay? So there are a few components, uh, basic components of a machine learning system. I'll just quickly go through them. Sir, uh, sir has already talked about features, which are nothing but the, the, the term that, you know, people from the non-statistical domain coined for representing the variables of interest. So in particular, to represent the, uh, the so-called predictor variables or the independent variables, what we call, what statisticians call independent variables in a model. Okay, so features are simply the, the variables uh, on which the response variable is supposed to be, is, exp is, uh, is uh, thought to be dependent and your model is supposed to capture that dependence to perform certain tasks. And of course, you need models. So once you have, you decide uh, what kind of a model you want to work with, you have to specify it and you have to estimate its, its parameters parameters, uh, as uh, Sir said, uh, training, uh, you know, the estimation for the training is another name that uh, uh, people in this community have given to the well-known task of estimation that all statist statisticians are familiar with. And the final and quite a uh, very important aspect of a, a machine learning system is testing and performance evaluation, okay? So you can build a given data, okay? You can build a machine learning system but what is, what is the use of having such a system if, it's, if it does not accomplish efficiently the task that, is, that it is supposed to do? So for, for example, if you have a facial recognition system and you find that it is not able to recognize face, you know, faces correctly even 50% of the time, then it's useless. You would need, ideally need a system which is at least 90 to 95% correct. So, so that is important. So this is just a schematic of that. Okay, so before I go into details, I'll quickly touch upon issues that are very relevant, but into, which, uh, uh, into details of the which I will not go in. But you should be aware because we, it, I think those who have, those who have you know, from, uh, become, uh, uh, were already familiar with regression or you know, learned about it even just today, you must have uh, realized that not all variables uh, need, need be, you may have data on a num large number of variables, but not data on, you need not bring into your model all the variables, okay? Because they do not add to the, you know, the, uh, the efficiency or the accuracy of your, uh, of, of the model. So you, the, so this, so it's important, which features of, which features you should use and which features you should simply discard, okay? So there are methods available. And they, these methods all are all you know uh, based on certain criteria, and typically the most uh, uh, the most uh, what shall I say, the most natural criterion is the the uh, the performance accuracy of the machine learning system. Okay, so obviously the the set of features which gives you the best possible performance is the set of features that you should work with. There are methods available in the literature. Okay. So uh, we, I won't go into any further details. Uh, I just skip, skip these. Uh, okay, and then we come to the notion of training and testing. Uh, these are buzz. These are very standard words used in the in the context of machine learning. Uh, previous speakers have already uh, you know introduced these ideas. So essentially, training is the is the process of estimation of the parameters of your model of your machine learning model using something called training data. That means data that is available from the past, okay? So given past data, or which actually encapsulates your past experience in the, in the problem domain, 
you use that that data to estimate the parameters of your model and that is that is what is training that is what it is and you say the training data is labeled if the associated outputs are also available okay so for example uh, if you your 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 uh, your uh, your, uh, the problem that you're trying to, uh, trying to, um, you know, trying to solve is a facial recognition problem. Then, uh, you know, you your data, your data will consist of pictures of faces of, uh, you know, lots of people. And so, uh, if in addition to the pictures, the names of the persons are also there, then that is the label for your data. Okay, so. Essentially, that is one, what is meant by labeled data. Otherwise, it's said to be unlabeled. Now, we, we can also perform machine learning on unlabeled data using unsupervised learning techniques, as Sir has already mentioned. So testing, what is testing? Now, once you have, you, on the basis of the training data available, once you have trained your model, that means you, your model is now ready to be used. Now you would like to apply that, that, uh, that model or that technique to new data to see how it performs. And actually, the, uh, the, uh, the, an indicator of performance of, the, uh, the, of your machine learning um, model or algorithm is how it performs with the new data. Because typically, if you apply it to, to the training data itself, it is expected that it will do very well with it. Because you use the training data to construct it. It, it can also happen that if your model is in, inadequate, then even with training data, you will not get good, good performance. So I'll, I'll come to that. So, so in, to, in order to assess the performance of a particular machine learning approach, you actually need test data. How it performs on test data is actually a more uh, unbiased estimator of how it, what it, its overall performance is like. Okay. So performance evaluation. Okay. So we have um, two uh, uh, in the in the in. Uh, so as I told you. Uh, when you assess, try to assess the performance of a machine learning uh, uh, system or algorithm with the training data itself, it will give you biased results. Why? Because it will give, it will perform. It's expected that it will perform reasonably very well, except in certain situations where your underlying assumptions were not adequate. Okay, so that is why uh, this. Uh, so. Um, so we actually, uh, in this context, therefore, we, uh, we distinguish between two scenarios. One is that of overfitting. What is overfitting? We say that a particular model has, has, uh, overfits the data. If it overfits, if it gives better performance with training data as compared to the test data. Okay. And you have the reverse uh, scenario, the converse scenario of underfitting, where you get poor performance even with the training data. So you see, these are two extreme situations that you have to avoid. So you have to go for the golden mean. So you have to ensure that your model is such that both these extremes are avoided. Okay. So performance measures depend upon the task that you're trying to perform. So for example, if the task is regression, you use mean squared error. For classification, you make use of something called the misclassification rate, which is simply, what is it? It's simply the number of test samples wrongly classified divided by the total number of test samples okay so it's a simple percentage of wrongly uh, label uh, 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 wrongly classified test samples or conversely you can also use the percentage of correctly classified uh, training samples uh, test samples these are both equivalent and for clustering there are certain other uh, uh, evalu eva evaluation measures that are available Okay, so I'll just skip this. Okay, so two uh, notions very uh, central to machine learning are those of abstraction and generalization. I believe Sir referred to, the, uh, to this as well. So abstraction is the capability of a machine learning method to extract information which is meaningful for the task that you're trying to perform. Okay, so how is it measured? It's measured by its performance on training data. Okay, so if you have, if you the, the the model that you have learned from the training data is such that it performs very well on training data, then we say that it has very good abstraction capability. Okay, and what is generalization? Is the capability to perform induct inference, uh, inductive inference in respect of the machine learning task. How by looking at its performance with the test data. Okay, so if it's 
the if it performs uh, uh, very well if your the learned system performs very well with test data as well we say that it has very good generalization capability okay so i'll just skip these details so this is just a simple illustration of a classification problem uh, where you know where you know the the notions of underfitting and overfitting are explained now i haven't really introduced the classification problem but i think you 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 more or less understand what it means uh, so here this is a, this an there's an uh, this is an illustration of a, a classification problem involving two classes so two classes and the training samples for the two classes are represented by two different symbols the blue crosses and the red circles so if you use a simple model as on the left okay you see that it does not even separate the training samples very well whereas you would expect something that is there in the middle okay you would expect a, 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 an algorithm which will separate them very reasonably well now you see it doesn't uh, separate them perfectly well there are you know two samples which are wrongly classified so one plus is to the bottom one circle is to the top so these two samples are wrongly classified but if you really want to perfectly classify all the training samples then you will need a very complicated model as on the right now that is uh, uh, you now by all means it would appear as if that is the best approach but it turns out that having a very complex model does not really give you always give you be best better good performance on test data okay so the two extremes of underfitting and overfitting uh, exemplified by the two figures on the two sides are to be avoided okay so i'll just skip this because uh, so let us come to the types of machine learning ta uh, certain broad categories of machine learning tasks about which i think you already have some idea uh, based on the you know the discussions in the earlier lectures uh, so the first one is supervised learning where you make use of label training data to build your uh, your machine learning algorithm the second one is unsupervised learning where you use un, uh, unlabeled training uh, data to perform certain uh, uh, certain uh, machine learning tasks and there's a third category uh called semi supervised learning where, you, where this is used when you have very few very little training data i mean there are many ap many applications or application areas where you know it's not easy to get training data okay you may have to destroy things to get get, uh, get training data so uh, in such cases uh, there is a intermediate approach where you combine both okay so i'll basically talk about the first two because uh, given the time constraints uh, not possible to go into the other last one is of course reinforce, reinforcement learning where you uh, where you where good uh, good uh, co correct actions are rewarded and incorrect actions are penalized and that is how learning progresses so the ba the basic uh, so as i uh, before i actually uh, go any further let me just again point out that machine learning methods are not all statistical in nature so i'm only going to talk about some uh, some of the better known machine learning approaches in the hope that if you are not familiar with them you will get to know them something as know know about them and maybe use them in your research or in your work or wherever you go whatever you do and of course implementing these methods is very easy lots and lots of softwares are available some of them are open source like r and python so you can easily uh, find what functions and uh, are used to implement these methods and you can easily implement them and use them in your own professional lives okay so what is the basic problem in supervised learning so here what you actually have is a collection of data points okay so i have given a represented each date each data point is a pair x1 y1 x1 comma y1 or x2 comma y2 and so on where the yi's they represent the labels okay and the xi's although uh, they, they can be single variables or they can be a collection of variables so they actually are the features they rep the x's represent the features the y's represent the uh, the uh, the responses or labels as depending upon the what problem we are trying to look at and the objective is to learn a function f which can predict y given in for data on x that is the basic problem in supervised learning so so there are special cases uh, of uh, uh, regression when the dependent variable y is real valued okay and the problem becomes a problem of classification when the dependent uh, variable is categorical in nature okay so if your data 
if you have reason to believe that your data ha can be grouped into two classes, okay, and uh, and you have data from both the classes, okay. So, for example, uh, if, if for a two-class example, uh, you know, in the case of a, say, a, uh, a tumor, whether it's benign or malignant, so two classes are there, and you have, you know, you have observations on a number of uh, medic, you know, uh, some, a number of variables, which are, you know, relevant to the to the problem. So. So uh, the, the so you the, so your categorical so your you basically want to predict the category. So if I call benign tumors to be to to if I label the benign tumors by the uh, by one and the the uh, the malignant tumors by two, then I have uh, this a two class problem with uh, these two categories and the and the uh, and the dependent vari variable uh, will be either one or two. And uh, your problem will be two. Uh, predict what uh, what y will be uh, when you are given uh, observations on the variables or the, on the features that you are you are looking at for some new case. Okay, so you learn the parameters of the ma model using the pa past data, the data from the past, and you apply the learned model to data which comes from the future. Okay, and you may you you may make mistakes, you may make uh, you make you may make take uh, make correct decisions, you may make wrong decisions. But your objective will always be to look for a, a model which will give you the best possible classification, the maximum number of correct classifications. Okay, so this illustration of uh, supervised learning regression is a well-known, uh, well-known problem, particularly to those who are statisticians. So what do you have here? So here, whatever illustrations I have will only involve one feature. Why? Because you see my other variable. Uh, the response variable, uh, if I take it with the response vari variable, I have two features. So it's very, it's very e easy to visualize data on two variables, right? So I will not go beyond that for illustration purposes. But just bear in mind that these methods are applicable to even to cases where there are more than one features or predictor variables, all right? So just for, to simplify the, uh, you know, the pictorial representation, I'm using just one feature. So here I have one feature, which is along the uh, x-axis, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the response variable is along the y-axis. And this is the data points. Uh, the, the data points are represented in the, in the form of blue diamonds. So you can, you can use you know, different models. So one could be a linear model. The other one could be a quadratic model. And you can use standard statistical methods to fit these models to your data. And then you can see which of these two models is which is better in the in the mean squared error sense, all right? And then this the second example relates to uh, class, the the, uh, the uh, problem of classification, where, where the dependent variable is categor categorical. So this is the example that I just talked about. So in the context of breast cancer uh, uh, identification, uh, uh, malignant versus benign, on the basis of tumor size, so just one variable, one predictor variable, tumor size. So if you plot the data, uh, so ec the predictor is along the x-axis. So you know the blue uh, circle, uh, the blue circles represent observations corresponding to the benign tumors, and the red circles represent observations corresponding to the uh, the malignant class. Okay, so this is your training data, the uh, configuration of your training training data when you only consider one single feature. Okay. So what, so what will your class, so basically you want to predict whether a new sample that comes to you with, inf with data on tumor size, into which class are you going to put it? Uh, will you put it in the malign, uh, malignant class or in the benign class? So for that purpose, you make use of a simple rule like this because you only have one feature, so all you need to do is up, uh, up, uh, find a threshold. Okay, so if the tum tumor size is smaller than the threshold, you classify it, uh, it, it as, uh, uh, sorry, it, it as uh, benign, and if it's larger than the threshold, you classify it in the, as a malignant tumor, okay? Uh, because you see, uh, the benign tumors are characterized by small tumor, tumor sizes, okay? Now, so that was uh, uh, with respect to a single predictor. Now what I'm doing is illustrating the same problem with, by adding another predictor, which is age, okay? So now I have pairs of, uh, pairs of predictors. So I plot the data on the, on the pair of predictors, and I get the, this con configuration for the data, okay? In, which is in two-dimensional space, okay? So here you can see 
that you can easily separate the training samples from the two classes by a simple straight line. So that is going to be your classification rule and that your objective therefore will be to, uh, to determine the uh, parameters of the straight line which will help you to separate these two, uh, these, these two uh, training uh, sets most efficiently. Okay? So, so you know uh, very well that uh, a straight line has two parameters, the slope and the intercept. So basically you will be making use of the, uh, the training data to estimate the slope and the intercept of the straight line. Okay? So that, that is a so, so simplistic, simplistic uh, I, I, what shall I say, illustration of the basic idea of the classification. Now, uh, statistical classification methods, and those who have studied statistics, you must have been taught classification methods there itself, like the base classification rule, linear discriminant analysis, quadratic disc discriminant analysis, and so on. So these are very standard tools that have been available to statisticians for a long, long time. But they are very useful, very, very useful even today uh, in, uh, in uh, providing solutions to uh, classification problems. And on the other hand, we also have some non-parametric uh, uh, method, methods, statistical methods, which, which can help you to solve the same problem. What is the difference between the two approaches? The difference lies in the fact that in the pa parametric approach, we assume a standard st probability model for the behavior of the features. So for example, we can assume uh, a very popular assumption is that the, you know, the feature, uh, feature uh, variable has a normal distribution in the two classes. Now the distributions will, may have, the two normal distributions may have different parameters, but they are of the same type. Okay. So that is one basic uh, 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 premise in the parametric approach uh, to the classification problem that the, you, the, the feature vector is, is, is assumed to be a random vector it ha and it has a probability distribution and most popular choice is the normal distribution and this distribution is assumed to be different for different classes. So the simplest assumption is where you assume that the means of the two normal distributions are different, distinct. Okay? And here of course you have parameters, the normal distribution has, a, uh, has the two parameters each so you have to estimate them using the data. Standard techniques are available. Okay, so uh, some, you know, this is a, so I'll just skip this, the details. So just quick, uh, so when you assume a normal distribution, uh, underlying normal distribution for the behavior of the feature vectors, a feature, here there's a, uh, yeah, feature vectors, here two variables, two features actually. So the, so when you, when the two, cla uh, the, the two classes uh, the, are such that the normal distribution in the two classes has the same variance, then you can, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the optimal classifier is a straight line. But on the other hand, when the variances are not the same as you can see on the, in the figure on the, on the right, then the, then the classifier is actually, uh, is, is actually quadratic in nature. And this is, this is a, there's a rigorous mathematical uh, statistical theory for all this. Okay, so as I said, uh, the simplest process, as you must have actually inferred from what I have said so far, the simplest possible uh, classifier is a straight line. All you have to do is make use of your training data to estimate the parameters of the straight line in an optimal way. Optimal in the sense that you try to optimize some suitable criteria, performance criterion, all right? So there are various techniques available. Uh, available. Uh, linear discriminant analysis is one such technique which is parametric in nature, but there are other techniques which I have actually given in lighter font because I want to emphasize that these are not parametric methods. They are non-parametric methods, okay? So, so, uh, so as I said, sometimes when the separability, uh, the, uh, the training data is such that the separability uh, between the two classes, it, it cannot be uh, cannot be described by a straight line. Then you have to resort to something called non-linear classifications. I I already showed you an example of that when I sh uh, showed you uh, I give, gave you an example of quadratic discriminant analysis. But there are other methods which which can actually do that. So even if your configuration of t uh, of um, sorry, I had this side. So even if the configuration is you know of this type. You can, there, are, uh, there are methods available which can help you to build a classification rule for separating the two classes. Okay, so let's talk about 
uh, some, uh, some popular non-parametric approaches. So the most popular one and very visu uh, visually appealing and also uh, appealing in many other ways is the decision tree approach, which can be used both for regression and classification. Okay? So this is this famous book by uh, Leo Breiman and others, which came out way back in 1984, where they proposed this approach. So what, what basically this method does is, uh, particularly the approach of uh, Breiman does is create something called a binary tree. That means you start with a root node where all the training data is concentrated. You divide it, div divide that data, uh, divide that, uh, the samples at the root node into two at each step. So it's a recursive, hierarchical process, recursive process. So I, I have a simple sl a slide which explains this. So this is the configuration of my training data from two classes, okay? So you see that there's, a, you know, it's not really, the separation is not really very straightforward. So what you do is, you take, so here there are actually two features, okay? So you take one feature at a time. So that's a characteristic of, of uh, the, the, the tree-based approach. Each feature is considered singly, okay? In, so you take one, one, the, this feature, you partition, you know, uh, you, f you threshold at, at, at a particular value of this, this uh, the feature along the y-axis. So now you divide it into two, uh, uh, into two groups. They're still not perfectly divided. So what you do now is you, t you, uh, you split the training set uh, using a threshold on, the, on, the, on this variable, okay? So now you have a slightly better, so this together with this, gives you a better description or better partition of the training data. And finally, when you actually uh, perform uh, uh, more, more thresholding, so uh, one is here and the other one is here, there's a perfect separation, okay? So taking this particular approach, which, where you take one variable at a time, is actually a very attractive approach because it's easy to, to visualize how the classification is progressing so this is a simple example. So when you get the slides, you can take a good look at it. It's a simple uh, two-class problem. But uh, given the weather conditions, so what are the features here? Different aspects of the weather. And based on that, the decision to be taken is whether to play or not to play, okay? So, so you know, the, look, if you, so the, what are the features? The outlook, whether sunny or overcast or rain and so on. Temperature, mild, cold or hot. Humidity, high, normal, high, normal, okay, two. And so on. So based on this, if you use the decision tree approach, this is the kind of, so it's very easy to interpret how the classification is happening. So you look at the outlook. If it's rainy, you again see, and if it's, again, it's windy, then you do not play. And similarly, you can explain each of, you know, you can explain how each of the branches, uh, you know, make the uh, decision. So you can take a closer look at this when you get the, get the slides, okay? So another very popular supervised learning approach is support vector machines. Now what this approach does is it, 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 it uh, transforms, it uses a transformation whereby your original features, so suppose you start with say 10 features. Now, in this approach, what, what, what is actually done is these, uh, these 10 features are transformed through some nonlinear uh, transformation into a larger number of features, okay? And why is this being done? Because it is expected that even if the data, if the training samples are not linearly separable, that means if you, if you cannot find uh, a line to separate the, uh, you know, the, the two, the training data, sorry, training samples in the original feature space, if you transform the data to a higher dimensional feature space, it is more likely for them to be linearly separated. That is the basic premise behind support vector machines. So here you see, it's a simple illustration of this idea. So this is your, the configuration of a training data from two samples. So here there is no linear separability. But if I, if I can find a transformation uh, by which the original feature vectors are transformed to some other, you know, it's, it's, you generally it's a nonlinear transformation. You know, the separate, so from two dimensions, if we go to three dimensions, you can actually find a, so in three dimension, what is, a, what, what is the equivalent of a line? It's a plane, right? So in three dimensions, you can find, actually find a plane, 
uh, which separates the two uh, training samples from the two classes, provided you choose this, this, uh, this transformation appropriately. Okay, so that's the basic premise behind support vector machines. Okay, so just another illustration of the same idea. Non-linearly separable training samples, but if I apply uh, a transformation to the original variables, I may, I, I may be able to make them linearly separable. Okay. So another very popular uh, 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 supervised learning model is that of uh, nearest, uh, is, is the nearest neighbor approach. So how, what is the motivation for this? See, the motivation for this is something that uh, uh, Professor Rao already talked about, the notion of similarity. So the, uh, the idea is that if an, um, a number of training samples are or a number of observations in the from, uh, on the features, they come from the same class, then they'll be very similar as opposed to training samples from other classes. Okay? So that, uh, that similarity is captured by something through this notion of nearest neighbor. So what you do basically is, if you have a new, a new observation which comes in uh, for, and which you want to classify, what you do is you compute its distance from, from each of the training samples. Okay? And you find which of these distances is the smallest. Now the training sample which is, which, to which this uh, smallest distance corresponds is the, near, it's the nearest neighbor of that sample. Okay? So you can put that new sample into the same class as the, its nearest neighbor. That's the basic idea. Okay? So the detail, now this, this notion of a nearest neighbor you can also extend to that of k nearest neighbors, where k is a positive integer greater than or equal to 1. Okay? So basically what you do is you find the, you, you compute the distances of the new sample from the, from the training samples and you take the k smallest distances. Okay? Now k is taken to be a positive integer greater than or equal to 1. Okay? When, when, the, when it is equal to 1, that is the simplest case which I just talked about. Okay? But when k is greater than 1, this is what you do. You find the, uh, the k smallest distances. So the training samples corresponding to those k smallest distances are actually the k nearest neighbors of the new samples. So if a majority of those nearest neighbors fall in one class, you simply put the new, new, uh, new case into the, in, into, the, into the same class as that of the majority of its k nearest neighbors. Okay, the same, the simple idea is illustrated here. These are your training samples. This is a new, new data, uh, new uh, case that has come. You compute distances from all the training samples. So if you use k equal to 1, this is the nearest, nearest one. And if you, uh, actually here k equals 3 here. So you take k equal to 3, then you see the majority, uh, which is 2, come from the, uh, the class represented by these plus signs. So you will categorize this one into the, the, into the same group as, or same class as these. Okay, so very simple idea, but it can be quite powerful. And then you have uh, the last of the methods that I'll talk about is uh, neural networks. Now, neural networks, uh, the so-called uh, artificial, or uh, strictly speaking, artificial neural networks, because they are different from the neural networks that you have in that uh, uh, that we have in our, you know, in the in the human brain or in, or elsewhere in the human body or in, even in the in, in, in other, other, other living, living beings. So you see, uh, the, basically the, these networks mimic the, uh, the, um, the uh, amazing computational uh, capability of the human brain. And what is the, uh, by uh, trying to mimic its architecture. Now it's not very easy to mimic the architecture of the human main, brain, no, but uh, you know, the same uh, idea is applied here. So as you know very well, what, uh, what does, uh, you know, how, how does a human brain process information? It's a, it's a, there's a hu massively parallel network of uh, 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 nerve uh, cells called neurons, which are actually very simple, simple cells with, uh, with very uh, limited, uh, what shall I say, information processing capability. But when they work together, they, can, they, they, uh, they help the human brain to process even very complex information very fast and very efficiently. Okay? So to realize this, uh, networks were proposed whereby uh, some uh, artificial, so-called artificial neurons, networks of artificial, so-called artificial neurons, neurons were proposed which could take in several inputs but 
uh, generally, uh, um, unless they are uh, they are in intermediate neurons, they give uh, uh, one uh, one or maybe more than one outputs, and each neuron performs some simple computation. So all the inputs that are that that uh, that arrive at that neuron, they are uh, they are operated upon by some simple uh, some some simple operator here, and then the output is given out. And uh, there's a uh, there's a uh, huge uh, a big network of such computing. Okay, th now, the advantage of using this approach to perform the classification uh, task is that even very complex boundaries can be, can be, uh, can be, uh, uh, can be inferred or uh, detected by you design, designing the network appropriately. Okay? So if you uh, choose your uh, network in an appropriate fashion, you can actually identify even very complex boundaries in your data set. Now, and by the way, uh, these, this artificial, uh, okay. So this one, so that, that is, so this is basically what is meant by a neural uh, network. So I have a, something called an, a neuron, which takes in several, uh, several uh, inputs, and it gives out a single output. And the, uh, the uh, see the output is, a, is some sort of a nonlinear combination of a weighted sum of these inputs. Okay, so that's basically the principle on which several uh, neural network models work. Okay, so this is one special case called multi-layer perceptrons, where you have one input layer and one output layer, and you have one or more hidden layers. Okay, so the architecture is something like this. So input layer, input uh, the cells in the input layer, they take in one inputs and they give they they uh, they, they are passed on to the hidden uh, to the to, to the to the neurons in the next uh, next layer without any transformation okay now so inputs are received from each of the input uh, input neurons by each of the cells here so that new nonlinear transformation of the weighted sum takes place here and it's passed on okay and so this is the simplest case where you have a single hidden layer you can also introduce more hidden layers and make the model more complex and it's possible to, uh, you, you know, it's possible to. Uh, so basically, what is needed is, uh, is estimating the, the so-called weights. So basically, what you're doing, is, what the neuron is doing, is computing a weighted sum of the inputs. Okay. So it's these these weights that you will need to estimate from your training data. Okay. And there are methods available for doing that. It's uh, that uh, that is called. The, there is a method which is a very popular method is called the method of back, back propagation of, error, uh, of errors. So I'll just skip these slides, it's unnecessary detail. If you're mathematically inclined, you can go through them, okay? So I'll just highlight, uh, through this slide, I will highlight the fact that neural networks are capable of uh, modeling very complex decision boundaries, okay? And so they can, they're useful for very complex uh, you know, for uh, solving complex co classification problems. On, but there are various uh, uh, ver various neg negative aspects also. Uh, I'll not go, go into those details right now, but you have to be careful because uh, the model has become complex. So it's expected that, you know, it, 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 one of the ma major problems with new, uh, this uh, MLP models is that they tend to overfit, okay? So that's a major problem with them. Okay, just, so just to, uh, for comparison. The, the boundary that you get with a linear classifier, the boundary that you get with a classification tree, and the kind of boundaries that you can get with neural networks. So this again is an illustration, illustration of the same basic idea. So you have these, uh, you know, uh, so this, is, uh, this gives you a linear classifier and this gives you more complex boundaries, okay? So this is, I have this, some, some results with the, some uh, standard data set. I'll just skip these slides. Uh, the next point I would like to highlight is that there is there is there are methods available whereby you can combine the outputs of a number of classifiers to get even better performance. Okay, so these methods are called ensemble methods. So I have listed I have li the, the, I've listed some of the more popular ones here: bagging, boosting, and random forest. But because of constraints of time, I'm going to just skip them. When you get the slides, you can go through them. The ideas are very simple, but they are very powerful. They can actually help to p improve the performance of cl uh, perf classification performance when you take the uh, the you know take a number of classifiers together. Okay, so the basic ideas are all given here. So let's come to unsupervised learning. So as as I said, 
when you have unlabeled training data. So you see, I have, I, this is the training data with corresponding to two features, but no labels. So that is why same color, I've used the same color. But what do you observe from this, the configuration of points? That there seem to be groupings in the data. So how do I capture these groupings in the data? I do so by applying the so-called unsupervised learning methods. So there are very, now actually this is nothing, uh, so the cluster, the well-known clustering methods in statistics, they all solve this kind of a problem, okay? And as Professor Rao, Rao pointed out, they essentially, you apply these methods when you have a lot of data available and you don't have much idea of the interrelationships or the inner, you know, inner, uh, uh, you know, the inner, uh, what shall I say, inter, uh, uh, the, the dy dy dynamics of the features that, uh, that the, the, the variables that you're working with. So to begin with, what you can do is try to apply clustering methods to your data, find natural groupings within the data, and then pro uh, apply further analysis to, e to the data in, in each of the clusters. To to do even more sophisticated analysis. So, for example, you can you can apply, you can use uh, you can use this information as training data for uh, for supervised methods and so on. Okay. So, this is an example that Sir also referred to: uh, uh, grouping of uh, genes uh, uh, and some more. You know, you can segment markets depending upon the spending patterns of people. If data is available to different companies on how people, on, on which uh, products people spend more money and so on and so forth, they can actually apply clustering methods and so on. And the similar, same is true for, because you see, uh, uh, domain knowledge may not be, uh, well, uh, uh, may not be available for these data sets. You, you don't know what, whether there actually are classes, groups within the data set. So you, the first step is to identify the groups, okay? So there, I've written down, the, listed the methods here. As I told you, they are all well-known methods. You can, you, there are, you know, any software will give you functions with the help of which you can compute them, okay? So the, some details are there, I'll just skip them because I just, uh, you know, different, the four different approaches. So there's one very popular um, algorithm that is used for uh, clustering, it's called k-means. That again is a very simple algorithm and very powerful also, provided certain assumptions are satisfied, okay? So I've listed the, you know, I've illustrated the cases where it doesn't work well. So you can go through them at, so, so what happens when you have clusters which are of this type? Then you see uh, your k-means will not work. It will give you nonsense clusters, okay? So there are situations where you have to, you know, use your judgment. And Sarah also talked about hierarchical methods, well known, uh, most of you are familiar, and I've given an illustration also with data that is a data set which is available in the literature. So illustration with three different algorithms, depending upon what kind of a distance you've used. And here again, this is something that Sir already showed, how the single linkage distance and the complete linkage distance is defined. Then, then some other approaches are there, model-based methods and so on. And the most powerful approach is the density-based method where where uh, clusters which are irregular shaped, they can also be easily identified. So you see when you have a cluster of this type, and a you know, the, the two clusters where one is elongated, they were, many of the, early, the methods will not work well, okay? So uh, this, the, uh, you know, standard methods will, uh, will work he well here, but in, in this case when you apply them, like for, uh, then you will get nonsense clusters, clusters that are not meaningful. There are other density-based algorithms, I've given some names here, DB scan optics, which actually identify the clusters correctly, okay? And they also identify these so-called noise points. You know, there are some data points which do not seem to belong to any cluster. They're called noise points. The, uh, the earlier approaches, they could not identify uh, noise points. They used to put them forcibly in some of the clusters, okay? So th these algorithms actually identify them as noise points. So another illustration of how the different methods perform with non-standard types of clusters. You can take a look, some references are given, and quick look at applications in the health sciences. And as I told you, they are all borrowed slides, because you see, I have no expertise in the domain. So please forgive me if, you know, some of these, these scenarios that are considered here are not applicable in the Indian context, okay? Because I'm really, I really don't know. So the, these are the sources from which I've taken. 
So uh, obviously, huge amounts of data is available. And healthcare pro professionals can be aided in their tasks if they can apply, use machine, appropriate machine learning techniques to, to, uh, to, to you know, make more sense out of the data that is available to them. Okay? So I've listed a few of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the ways in which ML can help the industry. But the bottom line is to improve the quality of care and population, health outcomes, and reducing the health care cost at the same time. So it's possible to uh, implement economy and at the same time provide better care, health care, uh, if, if a judicious uh, application is made of. So there are you know, some, re some slides, as I told you, which, tell you, which, which, uh, try to, which justify why there is need for, need for you know, uh, using ML, ML tools in uh, health care. First of all, apparently a lot of data, health data is being, uh, being uh, stored digitally or electronically. And that, that, is that, that trend is increasing. Okay? So, and also there's a diversity of health data. Okay? So uh, you know, the, it's, it's possible to have tools, machine learning tools, which can actually uh, you know, exploit the information contained in different types of data, uh, health, healthcare data. And at the same time, there's been a lot of standardization in the domain of healthcare. Uh, I may be right. I, this is the information I got from the net. So for example, there are standard diagnosis codes. There are standard codes for laboratory tests. There are standard codes for pharmacy, for drugs, and so on. So this standardization actually helps to make this application of ML uh, tools even more meaningful. Because then what is, what is inferred by one in one part of the world is also applicable in the rest of the world. Okay? So uh, this is some, just summarizing, uh, uh, you know, uh, because of the poten potential benefits, the healthcare industry is also very in interested in, uh, in the application of these methods. And some example applications are here. Uh, for example, you can improve the accuracy of diagnosis and risk prediction. This is actually uh, a work reported in, uh, I think, uh, I think I haven't forgotten to give the, this. Anyway, you can also optimize hospital processes by uh, ensuring that there is a, uh, there's a judicious uh, utilization of scarce hospital resources uh, by categorizing the patient's you know, diagnosis-related group, whether, it's, you know, whether the person should be put into an ICU or not put into an ICU using an objective machine learning algorithm. Okay, so this is a uh, this is some published work. I have given the, the this thing here, the the link here. So this is they have used this kind of an allocation uh, prediction of yeah just a minute. So uh, some more examples are there. Please uh, go through them at your leisure. I think they are self-explanatory and also the links are provided. All right. So uh, with this, I come to an end and. Uh, I thank you all for your patience. I'm sorry I, I went over the time. <laughs>